Welcome. Welcome to another Legs Matter Lounge session. This is just great. This is part of the Expert Insights sessions. And thank you so much for joining us, either live or on catch up. Um, this is really great to have Ergo and in particular Sarah Bradbury with us today. And Sarah Bradbury is a nurse um, clinical advisor, a clinical specialist in this um, field. And it's good to have you, Sarah. So Sarah is going to be talking about going beyond compression therapy. So we're talking particularly here about the importance of assessment and, and those tricky, sticky, difficult, hard to heal wounds. Um, so pop your comments and questions in the chat and we will ask them at the end of this uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Sarah, and um, welcome. Thanks, Alison. And yes, welcome, everybody. Um, as Alison said, my name's uh, Sarah Bradbury. I'm the clinical specialist at Ergo. Um, just a little background about myself. So I've been in nursery for 25 years. Um, I've been specializing in wounds for about 17 years now in various environments so as a clinical specialist um, and also in the research arena as well. And I'm really pleased to have been invited um, to share this session with you today. So thank you so much. So as Alison said, we're going to have a look at going beyond compression therapy and we're going to have a look at the management predominantly of hard to heal wounds. But before I get started with the presentation, it would be really great to know who we've got online with us today um, and, and sort of how you were involved really in, in caring for wounds. So we've just got a very short poll. Um, that we're going to run just now, uh, just to find out exactly how you're involved in caring for wounds um, and, and how you're involved in caring for hard to heal wounds as well at the moment. So if you could run our first poll, that would be brilliant. That's launched for you, Sarah. Lovely. So we've just got a very simple question. How are you involved in looking after legs? So have we got any patients or carers on today? Um, have we got any acute or community nurses or any specialist nurses on with us? Uh, like I say, it'd be really great just to, to get an understanding of, of the audience. Just bear with us a second. So it's just a question to ask if, are you currently dealing with hard to heal wounds? And that could be a, as a, a healthcare professional, or even if you're experiencing one or have experienced one. A slight technical issue, sir. Yeah. Okay, um, no worries. Second, and uh, we will have it ready very shortly. So yeah, it can be if you're a patient and, you, and you've experienced having a heart to heal wound, um, then we'd like to know that as well. Here we go. So poll number two, um, are you currently dealing with heart to heal wounds? And it's just a yes or no answer for this one. So really simple. Yes. So we've got over half of you um, who've answered the question have said that you're dealing with heart to heal wounds. Um, and I think that's probably going to reflect what we see um, in clinical practice as well when we start now to have a look uh, through the presentation. So please do ask any questions um, as we're going through. If I don't get a chance as, as, as we're going along, I will certainly, um, we'll certainly get to questions and answers at the end of the session. But what we're firstly gonna have a look at today is um, look at what is a hard to heal wound um, and the influences on wound healing. So what leads us to have these hard to heal wounds? Um, the importance of accurate assessment, um, so that we can identify these wounds as quickly as possible. And then some of the best treatment practices, the standards of care that we should be putting into place um, to manage and, and reduce the burden of hard to heal wounds um, and looking at some of the more advanced or adjunctive therapies that we can use to help to manage them as well. So if we start with the concept of hard to heal wounds, so wounds that do not follow the normal process of repair and as a result may not respond to standard treatment. So that is a definition of a hard to heal wound. And we know from work that's been done recently or published recently, but actually been conducted over the last 10 years, we know that actually there's a growing burden of wounds within the UK. So the number of patients with wounds are, are rising um, and the number of wounds that we're finding much more difficult to heal is rising as well. And that's putting a huge burden onto the NHS, but also, you know, for, for 
you as patients who have to experience these wounds, have to live with these wounds, the impact on quality of life can be, can be huge. So it's really important that we have an understanding of why wounds become hard to heal and what we should be looking for in order to uh, make sure that we're going to treat these wounds as best as we possibly can. So when we look at hard to heal wounds, we know that a critical feature of them, so all hard to heal wounds will have the presence of an underlying pathology. So there's a disease process that's going on there that is gonna be part of the reason why this wound has become hard to heal. And we're gonna to focus today looking at venous leg ulcers predominantly, because we're going to be looking at um, what we need to instigate for venous leg ulcers that goes beyond compression therapy. And the way that um, venous leg ulcers you can identify uh, is being hard to heal is that it does not reduce in size by greater than 40% in four weeks from the first documented visit. And that's despite good standard of care. And what we mean by standard of care is what we would use to treat that underlying cause of the wound. And also as well, just all of the good clinical processes that we need to put into place to make sure that we're optimizing you as patients and also um, what, we're, what we're doing for you. So um, this is about, as we said, going beyond compression therapy. So what we're looking at are these wounds that even though we're treating the underlying cause of a venous leg ulcer, which is that chronic venous insufficiency and that inability um, of that blood to get good venous return back to the heart, even though we're, we're counteracting that with the use of compression therapy, we're still not seeing the healing that we would expect to, to take place. And there's lots of different reasons for that. They're most frequently associated with infection and with high exudate levels and also with peri wound complications. So that impact of having a wound is increased even further, obviously the longer you have it um, and the longer that you have to, um, you have an open wound to the skin, the much more likely it is to get infected, um, which can lead to pain and discomfort and impact on healing and the need to take maybe antibiotics or to have other kinds of treatment um, and also as well affects the peri wound so that this wound um, is likely to break down even further. And sometimes when we're looking at wounds as a specialist or as healthcare professionals, we sometimes can focus very much on managing those symptoms. And it is really important, we know from all the work that's been done, um, looking at quality of life and the impact of having a wound has on patients, you know, the common um, concerns that we'll have, you know, to do with that high exudate level, those leaky legs, any odour that may be coming from the wound, um, problems with getting around, problems with, um, with showering and bathing all of these these are really important things that we do need to manage but we also need to think as well um, is our priority to get this wound healed not every wound is going to be you're going to, go and to be able to heal and that's when symptom management is really important but um, but in the most cases we need to be approaching this wound as if we want to get it healed as quickly as possible so that's why it's really important then that we understand what a hard to heal wound is. So in terms of going beyond compression therapy, so there is no taking away from the fact that compression therapy for managing venous leg ulcers is the absolute cornerstone of practice. So it's the, the, the standard of care, it's the gold gold standard that we know actually works um, in, within wound care and when doing research in wound care it can be really difficult to ascertain a lot of the time um, whether the treatment is actually having a significant impact on healing but it's been shown um, multiple times for compression therapy um, that more ulcers will heal with compression than, than don't um, so it's not to take away from compression therapy. It's still really, really important. But we do know as well that even some venous leg ulcers that are properly managed with compression, and they, they, some will heal 32% to 55% will heal at 12 weeks and 68% 
we'll heal at 24 weeks, which so that's nearly six months that we're looking at here. But we can see that at six months, 32% of those, those wounds, even though they're in compression therapy, have still not healed. So between 12% of 47% of VLU patients managed over 12 months may not heal. So, you know, you could be living with this wound for over a year and all the impact and the consequences that that has. So even though compression therapy is key, and what we're talking about today is, is what we can do to enhance the effects of compression therapy and what we can use as supportive treatment. So not to replace it, but to work alongside it. Um, and so we do know from looking at these statistics that um, even though compression is key in some cases, and um, particularly in, in hard to heal wounds, we do need other factors um, in place as well to be able to get these wounds to heal in. And these can be addressing sort of general risk factors, local wound factors, um, even invisible wound factors. So things that happening within the sort of biology and the at cell level within the wounds that we need to address in order um, to, to progress these wounds to heal in. So we're just going to have a little look now at some of those different influences on wound healing. And we've got a quote here it's from a really good um, set of guidelines that was published in 2019 um, by, by Leanne Akin um, and a group of clinicians. And they said it's a really necessary for us as clinicians to be able to distinguish between wounds that are likely to heal with standard treatment and non-responding wounds that may require, that may require further intervention. Um, and there's lots of different things then that we need to consider and identify as part of our assessment process as to um, whether the wound is going to be or likely to become hard to heal. So again, it's really important that we identify those barriers to healing and address these factors so we can just optimize um, outcomes for patients as much as possible. Before we, can, um, before we can progress a hard to heal wound, we need to be able to identify um, that that is the case and that an intervention needs to take place. So there's so four main things that we, we think about um, when we are thinking about influences on wound healing or risk factors. And the first one is going to be the underlying disease state. So as we've said, we know that hard to heal wounds are going to be associated with a pathophysiology. So there's going to be a disease process and we need to identify that. Um, in the case of leg ulcers, predominantly we're going to be looking at is the, the ulcer caused because of a venous insufficiency? Is it because there's um, arterial disease? So there's not enough blood um, getting down to the lower limb and delivering oxygen and nutrients um, to the wound area. Is there something like neuropathy? Is there nerve damage that may be contributing as well? It's really important, again, on why we need to um, be doing accurate wound assessments, that we identify that underlying disease state, because it's only then that we can begin to implement things like compression therapy, um, which will then be able to help to counteract that underlying etiology. Secondly, we have the clinical risk factors. So these are factors to do with the patient themselves. And there's quite a lot here, again, we could talk about. Um, one of the key things that we know um, in terms of hard to heal wounds is the, the comorbidities, as we call them. And these are all the other um, uh, diseases or, or processes that may be going on alongside your wound. Um, and we know that there's a correlation between the worst wounds and the sickest patients. So the more um, medical problems that you have going on, um, the more likely it is that a wound will become hard to heal. And this can be things like diabetes, um, which we know is a risk factor in itself um, for hard to heal wounds. Things like cardiovascular disease, so your high blood pressure, um, and your high cholesterol, chronic inflammatory disorders, so things like rheumatoid arthritis or any um, sort of inflammatory disorder where you need to have um, immune suppression treatment. So when you're not um, able then to fight infection in the same way, and that can really have an impact on the ability of the wound to heal. If there's cancers, that kind of thing, they can all impact 
um, on, on wound healing and leave the wound at high risk of being hard to heal. Obesity and smoking as well, we know, um, particularly smoking is related to, again independently as a risk factor for non-healing. Increasing age in itself isn't, but when you link it with things like um, with poor nutritional status and with all those other diseases that are going on, then that becomes a risk factor for non-healing. Genetic factors and also some medications as well that we know um, can impact on healing. So things like if you're having to take corticosteroids, for example, or gain immune suppression drugs, um, they can impact on wound healing. So lots of different things that we need to be thinking about. And this is again part of that assessment process because this is where, when we're doing our assessment, this is where we identify all of these risk factors that may be present and that's going to give us an indication of hard to heal wounds. There are also patient related risk factors as well that are um, not related to sort of clinical issues. Um, and a lot of this is, is around to do with um, the impact of having a wound on a patient. Um, so things like uh, patient's ex previous experience of treatment. So if, for example, you've had a bad experience um, with a, a wound dressing or a therapy of some kind, maybe you thought it didn't work or you found it painful, then that's then going to have an, um, an impact then the next time maybe you approach to have that dressing or therapy, you might be thinking, oh, I actually, I, I really don't want to, um, to have to do that because last time I didn't think it, it worked or it, it was painful. And that's then going to affect um, the, the ability of maybe of the wound to put into all the good things that we need to help that wound to heal. But that's something that we need to acknowledge as clinicians um, and that we need to have conversations with, with patients around so that we can get to the bottom of, of what happened and maybe then look at different options to help overcome um, those concerns that you might have. Things like um, psychosocial factors, so if depression, which we know can be associated with, um, with having a wound, particularly a non-healing wound, um, and dementia. So, you know, patients may with, with de dementia, it can be really difficult to um, help with their understanding of, of their wound and, and what we're trying to do about it. Sleep disorders can have an impact on wound healing. Um, and that's from two ways, really. Um, we know that lots of repair goes on at night when we're asleep, and then that includes our wound healing. Um, but also as well, the impact of not being able to sleep. So you know, if you've got a painful wound or you're worried about the wound leaking when you're asleep, or maybe just the stress of, of having that wound can all impact on sleep. Um, and, and when we're not sleeping, you won't be feeling yourself, you won't be feeling great. And that again in itself can have a really big impact um, on development of non-healing. So there's lots of different things um, that we need to think about in terms of patients themselves as well, about how they access care for their wound and, and about how um, they're going to engage with the treatment pathways that we um, are trying to put into place, there's going to be a big issue as to whether or not we can have successful management of chronic wounds. Thirdly, we can have clinical risk factors that are associated with the wound itself. Um, and again, there can be multiple factors to do with the wound um, that we can see, but also that we can't see. Um, so things that are happening under the surface of the wound. Um, we know that having more than one wound um, is a big risk factor for non-healing. And it doesn't matter if it's you've got a venous leg ulcer and a diabetic foot ulcer, for example. It doesn't matter if they're not the same type of ulcer. Just having more than one wound can impact on healing. It's also becoming much more generally accepted that hard to heal wounds will contain um, a biofilm or are fre frequently prone to, to clinical infection. Um, and again, it's important to know this as a healthcare professional um, so that we can then treat that appropriately to try and progress the wound. 
We know that wounds that are larger and are, that have been there for longer are going to be at much higher risk of healing. And then as well, we've got some of those cellular activities that are going on underneath the wound surface. And um, we've got enzymes that are necessary for wound healing, but can become impaired and then start to be destructive and start to cause problems with healing. And we know, again, from the research that all of these factors, again, can impact on, on um, the ability of the wound to heal and how long it's going to take to heal. And then finally, we've got, I've ter we've termed service delivery risks. Um, this is taken from that document I was talking about by, by Akin et al. Um, and it's talking mainly about, um, again, the, the responsibilities that we have as clinicians to identify um, about um, the, the, the service we offer in caring for wounds and making sure that we are putting into place the best practice that we possibly can. And so that's making sure that when we, we address all the symptoms of having a wound, we get it healed as quickly as possible, but also as well that we remember the patient at the center of that wound as well and the impact that it's having on them. So we have a responsibility as clinicians um, to if we are caring for patients with wounds to think about the practice that we're putting into place so making sure that we know the wound type so um, it's no good really you know just calling it a leg ulcer because there's lots of different types of leg ulcers that we can have and the treatments that we use for different leg ulcers is diff are different themselves. So for example we need to know if it's a venous leg ulcer because um, we need to be able to know if we need to instigate compression therapy. But also, on the other hand, we need to know if it's a problem with, with, with the arteries delivering blood to the lower limb that's causing the wound, because the therapy for that is going to be very different. We're actually not going to use compression therapy in those cases. So establishing the cause of that leg ulcer is really important. Um, making sure that we use the best um, treatments that we have once we've got that diagnosis, um, making sure that we're selecting dressings that are most appropriate for that wound. And we're going to have a look at some um, sort of different, more advanced therapies, as they're called, um, for wound healing. Just, but just making sure that we're doing everything we, that we can, like we say, we need to sometimes go beyond just compression therapy, think about all the, these factors that are going to influence the wound healing and, and use treatments that are going to help with that. Lack of adequate healthcare, uh, health professionals, education and training can be really difficult such a huge burden, um, as we say, on, on healthcare professionals um, in terms of time and, and access to education. Um, but, you know, it's part of, of what we need to be doing to make sure that we're on top of our practice as much as possible. And also as well, finally, access to, to those more advanced treatments can be really difficult. So we need to think about that when we're putting together um, a management plan that's going to help us to address all of these risks that we've got going on. So this was quite an interesting survey that was done um, back in 2000, well it was published in 2020, uh, and this is in no way meant to point the finger at any kind of any clinicians at all, um, or it's no criticism, it's just a way for us to learn really about um, how we can improve what we do. And what, um, what happened within the survey was that they were they asked a, a large group of, um, of nursing staff to identify the wounds on their caseload and to classify them as either improving or as hard to heal. And then they looked then at what was done um, differently, if anything, for, for those different types of wounds. So wounds that were progressing as you would expect them to, and then the wounds that are, are not progressing and that, that are becoming hard to heal. And what they found was that the dressings that were used for the wounds were pretty much the same, regardless of whether they were not healing or healing. Um, the thing that they did notice was that with the, the hard to heal wounds, it, there was an increased frequency of dressing changes, but not actually with the treatment itself. So the treatment regime that was already established for that wound didn't change. Um, and it's really important when we identify that a wound is, is now hard to heal, 
um, or non-healing, that we then adapt our treatments to suit that, to try and, and address all of the issues that may be going on there. So, you know, we would expect to see changes in treatment once we've identified that a wound is harder to heal. And uh, now finally, they also found as well that the use of more advanced therapies um, and the particular example they used was negative pressure wound therapy uh, was negligible, again, whether the wound was healing or non-healing. Um, even though we know from the evidence um, and the trials that have been done with such things as, as negative pressure, that these can help to heal wounds and help to decrease the burden. Um, of the ulcer in terms of dressing change frequency and manage and exudate those kinds of things. Um, so again, we weren't really adapting our treatments to be able to, to address the fact that we, we had a, a wound that was not healing as we wanted it to. So this is why hopefully we've sort of set the scene now um, to have an understanding of why it's really important that we perform a very in-depth and accurate assessment for all patients who have um, who have any type of wound, um, talking particularly about leg ulcers today, because it's the, the assessment process that is going to help us to identify um, the risk of the, the wound becoming non-healing or hard to heal, but also as when as well then when it is hard to heal, what we need to be instigating. So what may be the potential causes of that wound being hard to heal? And unless we're doing that assessment process, we're not going to be able to, to pick up on those, those sort of nuances really about, um, about the wound itself. And another study that was done um, looking at some data which was collected uh, to do with the, the quality and improvement um, we can achieve within the NHS. Um, they found that only 25% of their sample, the patients had had a comprehensive wound assessment. And this um, was reflected in the work that was also done by, by Julian Guest. So that burden of wounds that we were talking about at the start of the session, um, they found that 12% of wounds had no recorded diagnosis and 56% of wounds um, recorded as leg ulcers, so lack the differential diagnosis. So when we, when we mean differential diagnosis, we mean, um, is, it, is it venous? Is it arterial? Is it mixed? Is it due to something else? So looking at what the underlying cause of that leg ulcer is. And we need to be able to do that. And we need to be able to do it as early as possible so that we can then put into place evidence-based treatment plans um, that are going to address the non-healing of the wounds. So it's really important that we do these assessments so that we can make that diagnosis um, and then we can put the, the appropriate treatment into place. Um, if you've been on any of the other sessions today, and I'm sure throughout the week, you'll probably hear about the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, which is a, a brilliant initiative that's in place um, looking to improve standards of care for wound care um, across NHS England. Um, and one of the, the streams that they're particularly focused on is to do with the lower limb. And they've released some recommendations for the care of, um, of, uh, of patients with lower limb conditions. And they state that any patient with a non-healing leg wound should receive assessment within 14 days of initial presentation. And what they're acknowledging there as well is that by the time, anyway, as a patient, you, you develop a wound, maybe you try to treat it yourself initially because you, you just think that you maybe got you scratched your leg out in the garden for example you, you're not aware that you've got problems with your, your blood supply and things so to you you just pop a dressing on um, and, and you leave it for a few days and see what happens uh, and then you recognize that perhaps it's not looking like it should be so you try to make an appointment with the doctor or the practice nurse um, to have a look at that wound and then by the time you've seen those that um, healthcare professional, and they've recognised that actually there's a leg ulcer here. Um, all of this is taking time. So by the time that the actually you, you know you actually present with a leg ulcer, you could have had that that wound on your leg for a couple of weeks already. So if we're then not going to do an assessment for another couple of weeks, that wound's going to be in there for a month before before anything. Um, 
in terms of, of managing that that non-healing has taken place so it's about recognizing that and also as well about the the suffering and the the impact and quality of life that, that having that wound for longer has on patients and that's where our assessment comes into place and as a consequence of of recognizing the importance of um, of wound assessment we established um, also by the national wound care strategy um, and by some work that came before was a minimum data set for wound assessment. So they've actually written a list um, of things that we should be assessing patients for when they present to, to us as healthcare professionals. So it's establishing baseline data that should be documented for every patient that presents with a wound. And it's about making sure that every patient who presents with a wound um, is assessed in the same way, so it's standardized, and that will help then the decision making as to the most appropriate um, treatment. So if as a patient you go in to see your nurse and they're asking lots and lots of questions and it can seem quite tedious, um, but this is why, this is what we're trying to find out is just to gain as much information as we possibly can and to make a diagnosis of that wound and to make sure that you're getting the best um, treatment possible. And if nobody is asking you these questions, again, that's another that's another thing to think about as well. If not, why not? Why why haven't you had that assessment um, in a timely manner? So again, something to think about in terms of, of, of your experience when you, you go to see um, your nurses or your GP. So what should we be doing? So we're gonna look at each of these in turn, but it's about consistent and optimal standard of care. Um, so making sure that we're putting into place all that really good baseline um, clinical care that we should be for every patient with a wound. We need to be making sure that um, we're making early referral to specialists wherever that is indicated. We need to be assessing the effectiveness of any treatments that we put into place. Um, and we also need to be improving our patient relationships as well. So, you know, moving away from that sort of paternal, maternal approach that, um, that was often taken by doctors and nurses, or also that was perceived by patients as well. You know, it was very much expected that the, the doctor or the nurse would tell you what to do. And we're very much moving away from that now to recognizing the sort of partnership that needs to take place between the healthcare professional and, and the patient to be able to get the best possible outcomes. So in terms of implementing effective standard of care, optimal wound healing will occur when that same standard of care is delivered across the whole care pathway. So from the beginning of, of a patient having a wound to the, the end of the patient having a wound and whoever um, they meet along the way, so whatever different type of clinician, healthcare professional, um, member of the multidisciplinary team, uh, specialist that they might come across, um, the same standard of care in an ideal world should be um, being delivered. And again, this is something that um, you know we need to, to aspire to achieving um, as clinicians. Um, and so this quite long list is what um, some of the, the experts that came together thought should, should constitute standard of care. Um, it was about earlier intervention, so improving time to healing by identifying wounds that have delayed healing and making sure that we put an appropriate treatment response into um, place as soon as possible. Accurate assessment and diagnosis of the patient and wound. So making sure that we're assessing patients as soon as possible and addressing the underlying cause of that wound um, by making that diagnosis. Optimal patient and wound management strat strategy. So we talk about identifying barriers to healing. So that's looking at um, the wound itself, um, the condition of the tissue on the wound bed. We're looking for um, the prevention of infection or treating infection at the first signs that it appears. So really prompt intervention. And so to ensure that if an infection does develop, it doesn't become prolonged and it doesn't really have um, a huge impact on healing and, and quality of life as well. So using um, for the, the healthcare professionals listening, you know, we've got our, 
uh, frameworks like timers to be able to, to implement, to be able to identify and address those barriers to healing. We need appropriately skilled health professionals, so again, maintaining that education, early referral to specialists, um, modifying the risk factors that we've identified during our assessment process. So looking at, you know, um, have we got a patient with multiple comorbidities, for example? Have we got um, a patient with poor nutrition? What risk factors are there that we need to address to be able to optimize the ability of the wound to heal? And we need to be monitoring our outcomes as well and responding as soon as possible. And that's part of our early intervention as well um, to signs of delayed healing. So using, um, like the beginning, we talked about what we would expect um, from healing in terms of, of size reduction of a leg ulcer. So, you know, if you haven't got that 40% reduction over four weeks, then um, responding to that, actually taking action and making sure that we're putting measures into place. In terms of early referral to specialists, um, what the, the burden of wound study found was that referrals are currently taking months rather than days. Um, and actually that means that again, we've got a delay in often getting specialist advice. And what we're specialists can offer, and there's diff very many different types of specialists, um, is that they can help with that diagnosis and any tests that need to be done to help with diagnosis. Um, and they can help as well when when the, the wound isn't responding like we would expect, um, there's different things that all of these different professionals and specialists can offer in terms of, of helping the wound to heal. Um, and it's important when we're out there, you know, in the community that we know where to refer to and also, um, you know, within our local pathway. So what services we have available to us locally and how we go about accessing them. Um, and use just some of the examples of, of some of the specialists that um, as a patient you may be referred into or, or as a healthcare professional you have available to you. So you use in your tissue viability services and your complex wound clinics, you know, as soon as you identify that uh, a wound is at risk of non-healing or is becoming hard to heal, using that criteria make that referral as early as possible um, so that we can get access to um, more advanced assessment or using more advanced therapies um, as much as we possibly can. Referring into dermatology, if we're having problems managing the skin, and also as well um, within the, the guidelines that are becoming more prominent and, and more current now is about early uh, referral to vascular as well. So our vascular colleagues. So um, this all came about from a study which found that um, healing of venous leg ulcers was significantly higher when patients underwent a treatment called um, early venous reflux ablation or EVRA. Um, and that was to correct the venous disease alongside compression. And that the, the, the healing was higher when you used that vascular um, intervention as well as compression therapy compared to, to using compression therapy on its own. So again, it's about going beyond just compression therapy at times and recognizing that there's other things that we can do. Um, and we've very much been encouraged now within um, guidelines such as the National Wound Care Strategy Programme off the back of that to make early referrals to vascular so that um, we can identify not only this correction required if a patient's got arterial disease, um, but also as well if, if there's any intervention that can be performed for patients with venous leg ulcers as well that can optimize their potential for healing. So I'm just gonna show you a short video now. Um, it's about four minutes long, but it's a, a patient story. Um, and hopefully it'll just, give again some, some context as to the experiences of patients um, who are who have difficult to heal and long-standing leg ulcers and also as well how that can be improved by, by making referrals to specialist services to get some additional support to be able to progress the wound. Please let me know if there's any problems with the sound or anything.
My name's Gavin. I'm a pub manager in Molden and Essex. I'm 38 years old. I work. Tip me all the time. 15 years ago, I had a bad car accident. I broke one leg. The other leg, I smashed the foot and drove the rest of the leg out through my pelvis. Because of this, I was rebuilt, but I spent nearly five months in hospital and had to sort of learn to walk and get going again. This then caused me problems with circulation. I was told when I left hospital that my leg was going to swell up, which it did. As my shifts got back to normal at work, I was having to set the alarm for two hours after I'd gone to bed so I could get up and take a shower because I was swelling up so much. And unfortunately, eventually I scraped my shin and uh, that was the start of my adventure in leg ulcers. Being a typical man, I was 26, I didn't think I'd ever have a problem healing. It kept getting bigger and bigger. Eventually, the doctors, you know, after he'd seen it, was then going to the doctors every day for the nurses to dress it, district nurses coming to the pub, and this went on probably for two months. He straight away lost any sort of confidentiality because you go into the waiting room, half the pub regulars see you in the waiting room, so you can't avoid the conversation. The district nurses do a fantastic job, but they come when they can come and see you. So middle of service, I'm having to disappear for 40 minutes with a couple of nurses upstairs. It's no longer is, is your condition, it then becomes public. And it's a conversation you have to have, you can't avoid having. You've got me at 26, 27, sitting there with a lot of sort of 60 year old men and women who turn up on mobility scooters and shuffle in with huge, great big legs and massive ulcers. And, you know, it's quite, quite worrying as a 26 year old, you think I'm 26 and they're 60, what the hell am I going to look like at 60? I can't do what I want to do, the wife can't do what you want to do. I used to play a bit of sport, I used to do a bit of rugby, a bit of tennis. I don't do anything like that anymore, we don't go swimming anymore. The bandaging, the stockings, the things like that, you don't know when the leg ulcer is going to start, so there's no point booking a holiday. My wife's obviously the luckiest woman alive, because she gets to live with me. We try and get out to sort of rock and metal gigs and then we go to a few rugby games as and when we can. But she's not going to get two weeks in the sun because I'm not going to have two weeks in the sun. One of the district nurses had said there was a new tissue viability unit. When I first went up there, straight away you feel, you feel like you've gone to another level. You know, they've, they've got bandages that I've never seen. They've got dressings I've never seen or heard about. They're sitting there and explaining this. You know, this is what we'd like to do, but we can do this, and this will work with you. I'm an awkward patient as well. I wear a lot of feet, sort of up to 16 hours a day. I need to be on the feet. I need to wear proper boots or whatever. So there's always been a compromise in care right from day one. One of the nurses that ran the unit, I told her then, I don't know if you saved my leg, but you definitely saved my job. And that is solely because of their expertise and, and their knowledge. It's a chronic condition, it's not going to go away, but it doesn't worry me anymore. I know it will hit. I always find that quite moving, um, you know, as, as a nurse, to, to really bring it into focus, you know, that um, the impact it has on our patients, but also as well, the positivity at the end of that, because, you know, he, he had that referral into a specialist service, um, and where we do have access to, to different treatments, and there's usually a lot of experience around sort of different things that can work and don't work, and, uh, and so, you know, he had a really positive outcome um, as a consequence of having that early referral. And you also talked as well then about um, how, you know, there had to be compromises in care because, you know, um, he had a, a really demanding job. He needed to be on his feet all the time, you know, and so we have to think about that as well, um, both as, as healthcare professionals and also, you know, uh, as for you with patients as well, about how we can improve that relationship. How can we make the necessary compromises while still putting into place all of the things that we need to put into place to try and get that wound healed for you as quickly as possible? 
So one of the things that we really need to focus on as well is about improving our dialogue with each other um, and, and making sure that we can create a partnership and also that we almost create a contract of care where patients are involved in, in the decisions around what their care is going to be. And that is agreed with patients wherever possible. And this is all about helping um, patients to, to adhere to the, the recommended care really. Um, and it's about making sure that goals are aligned. Because if a patient has some goals, um, which for us as healthcare professionals aren't realistic, um, but we've got goals as healthcare professionals that for you as a patient is just are impossible for you know for you to possibly live with we have then going to have a problem with with managing that wound and until we've had a conversation and we've identified what our shared goals are going to be and we can align them then we're really then going to to make sure that that you as a patient are empowered and in control um, as part of, of your plan of care and also as well the same for us as healthcare professionals so looking at what your previous experiences are, um, working with you to decrease, decrease the risk factors um, to do with non-healing, um, using patient information leaflets, you know, so if you're given an information leaflet by, by your healthcare professional, try and take time to read it because it's usually written in language, hopefully, that is quite easy to understand, but also just give you a, a really good idea about what we're trying to do um, and the reasons sort of behind that. Um, and as well that, you know, making sure that we as, as clinicians are identifying if further social support is required um, for patients, you know, is there a social structure in place? Have they got relatives um, um, or, or somebody to help with their care if needed? Um, would they benefit from attending a leg club, for example? which has obviously been quite difficult in the last sort of 18 months, two years with COVID. Um, but, you know, we're optimizing the, the opportunity for patients to be sociable and to learn from each other um, and, about, and to care for each other as, as well in the same way that, that we as, as nurses want to care for them. So assess an effectiveness as well. This is what we need to do. So we need to recognize um, if what we're doing is working. So as soon as we recognize how to heal wound and we put a therapy into place, we still need to then be re regularly reassessing if that is working for the patient. So still maintaining regular wound assessment and documentation, looking at what our initial objective was um, and are we achieving it? thinking has anything sort of gone wrong or anything we can do better and listening to the patients and engaging with the patients as well about their feedback and their experience. And then from a service perspective, it's, you know, doing clinical audit, benchmarking, reflecting on our practice and learning from any sort of clinical incidents that may have occurred. And then finally, moving on to those adjunctive therapies that we talked about and which, um, which Gavin in the video talked about as well, you know, how when he was when he had access to specialist services, how they had things that he'd never seen before. Um, and these are what we mean when we talk about those adjunctive therapies to, to promote healing. Um, and a definition of it is a therapy that's based on novel principles or technologies with a range of modes of action that's supported by evidence as well. Um, so it's, it's about those, what can you, what else can you do to help these wounds to heal? Um, and usually, you know, these advanced therapies are often initiated by the complex wound clinics or by your specialist services, because they've got the advanced skills and the knowledge in those settings and the access to these treatments as well. Um, but also, even from things like negative pressure, you know, making sure that um, we have maintained the skills that we have, unless we're using these therapies often enough, then and it's really hard to maintain our clinical competencies with regards to that as well. And how do we choose when a patient needs these adjunctive therapies? Well, it's doing that assessment and it's looking for that wound trajectory. Is the wound healing um, at a quick enough rate over a set period of time? Um, to mean that um, we would regard it as hard to heal. And when we're regarding it as hard to heal, what else can we do? Can we change something? Can we do something differently that is then going to help with that non-healing? And there's quite a lot now of, of different advanced therapies um, available to clinicians, some of them more available than others. I've got quite a lot here. 
Um, uh, some of them are, are very novel, some of them are still very emerging, um, but we've also got some what are classed as advanced therapies that are also very easy to use and very accessible. Uh, so we've got, as we've talked about our negative pressure, so a great therapy that the, the evidence you know, suggests works. So we should you know be using where we need to use it. Um, and there's devices now that are available that are much more portable and low profile and can be used with compression therapy. So again, using it as an adjunct to, to our compression therapy as a to sort of going beyond uh, just the compression and using something that's really gonna enhance um, its ability to heal. We've also got our protease modulated dressings, and again, big name, sucrose octosulfate, um, but actually it's a really simple dressing. Um, it's, it's nothing complicated, and as we say, it's readily accessible and it's, it's easy to use. So even though they can train more advanced technologies, it doesn't mean that they're really complicated. We also have oxygen therapy as well um, and electrical stimulation devices that some of you may have come across, as well as our, like I say, more, much more um, advanced and, and less readily available sort of cellular level therapies that can potentially be used as well. How do we choose? So we look at our healing trajectory, like we said, is the wound healing as we would expect it to? And also looking as well, is the patient managing to adhere to the standards of care? Because um, it's very difficult to put into place some of these more advanced um, therapies if we're not able to, to effectively treat the underlying cause. So again, it's about working with the patient, creating that contract around um, how we're best going to manage the ulcer. Um, and then once that's in place, you know, we can then look to make sure that we can any, any adjunctive therapies we put into place are going to be um, to be optimized as much as possible and we're going to get the outcomes that we would want. So aligning goals, managing expectations is really important. Um, remembering about any contraindications. So some of these products are incompatible with infected wounds, for example. So we'd need to be addressing infection or biofilm within the wound um, before we initiate the, these therapies, making sure we've got as healthy a wound bed as possible. And also remembering as well, sometimes commissioning can be difficult. Um, so even though these therapies are available, generally they may not be available um, locally and just to be sort of remember that as well when we're looking to access these um, these types of treatments. But I really love this quote here. It says an expensive therapy is any therapy that does not work or is not matched to the clinical goal or is inappropriate for the patient. And it's just sort of trying to remember to move away from focusing on how much a single dressing costs or single treatment costs and thinking about that bigger picture because we can you know we can persist with using something that that um, is less expensive for a long period of time and not see the healing we want um, and then that therapy is expensive because we're having to use it for such a long time and we're not getting um, the response that we want. Whereas if we were to use a more expensive therapy um, and use it for a shorter period of time and get the outcomes we want, then actually that's what's going to be cost effective. So remembering to look at the bigger picture and what we're actually trying to achieve. And then finally, remember, we need to do something different. You know, these, these are quite famous quotes. If you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got. Um, and also the lovely one from Albert Einstein, where he says, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You know, um, the longer a wound is open, the, the higher the risk of complications, which will then exacerbate um, non-healing. So we actually have a short window of opportunity to minimize those complications and, and you know progress those wounds to healing. So early assessment, you know, and don't do it if something's not working, um, but give it a decent chance to work. But if it's not working, you know, change it, do something different, look at what else you can you can do, what other services can you access uh, so that we're not always doing what we've always done and expecting to get the same result. So in summary, 
Compression therapy is the cornerstone of managing venous leg ulcers, but we do need to build on that to prevent and treat hard to heal wounds. Um, we, it provides the opportunity by doing that to improve quality of life and increase efficiencies up, uh, within the NHS as well. Early identification of at-risk wounds is really important to making sure that we're putting into place good standard of care and using those um, adjunctive or advanced therapies where they're indicated. And actively assessing and monitoring, um, so we're supporting the active management of wounds, making that diagnosis, um, making that specialist referral when it's needed and as early as possible, making sure that we're doing early interventions in partnership with patients um, so that we can try and optimise the, the outcomes for these hard to heal wounds. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I can see there's some, been some things in the chat. So I'm gonna come out of this presentation now. My contact details are there, um, just if anybody else did want to follow up with anything. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, as you said, your the video is just delightful and it's humans with the problems they have. Mm -hmm. and, and it really spoke powerfully, didn't it, of, needing to get access to the right treatment yeah. um, and I always find it quite interesting I, I mean uh, something that we don't know the answer to as clinicians is if everyone did everything right really really early on how many hard to heal wounds would we have mm -hmm. and legs matter are trying to change that by providing information mm. um, and so one of the, um, uh, in the chat, there's uh, been someone asking about some of this information as well. And so just to, we've only got unfortunately three minutes, um, but um, just to really, um, uh, the, the Legs Matter um, campaign was started to help people get this information earlier. And so what Sarah's saying is just so important. Um, and, and getting that information early can change people's path. <laughs> you know, often they go on to non-healing when sometimes it's not necessary, is it, Sarah? Um, and I just wondered if you have a thought on when, when someone's path they're on is a painful and debilitating one, what would you say to people about how to get off that path and onto a different um, healing trajectory or healing pathway? Um, I think, you know, I think we're recognising more and more. Obviously, we, we know the importance of, of assessment as we've just gone through, but it is really about dialogue with our patients as well, um, because until we're doing that, um, it can be really difficult for them to express maybe that, you know, they have problems that they're, they're in pain their quality of life is difficult you know sometimes we get patients who shut down um, and and you know don't engage them with this because they're not able to sort of express how they're feeling so mm. really just giving patients an opportunity to talk and um, will help you then to identify those patients who are having problems um, and so then looking to work with them at, at other options that are available to us. And we're actually quite blessed now to have lots of options available to us as clinicians. We just need yeah. to be aware of them and make sure we're using them appropriately. Yes. So just to encourage people to go to the Legs Matter site and see the downloadable information that we have there on the importance, Sarah speaks about the importance of uh, compression therapy. Um, and if you have a, a leg wound that hasn't been assessed or diagnosed, again, as Sarah says, then seek help for that. Know that you should be having that assessment, that someone should be able to tell you why that wound is not healing. Um, and just thinking about, let me just check in the, the chat as well. Um, it is, and someone points out about the issue about getting the language right yeah if, definitely if we don't know what we're talking about how can we ask for help you know yeah yeah definitely it's very difficult um someone's asking do do all areas have specialists that patients can be referred to um not completely mm. but mostly um and so um I just sorry my phone's buzzing um 
So uh, you can seek help. And so the important thing is, as Sarah's saying, is about having that conversation and go, okay, I've got a problem. I've had this wound for three months. I have a feeling there is something that can be done about this. Yeah. How am I going to get the help? Mm -hmm. Have you any thoughts on that sort of conversation, Sarah? Um, like I say, it's just important to have it really. And and also as well, you know, for are there specialist services everywhere? No, not consistently. Like we say, that um, in terms of, you know, has every area got a multidisciplinary clinic, a complex wound clinic, something like that? Not always, but they've usually got some specialist service that is accessible for advice, whether it be vascular dermatology, you know, tissue viability, lymphedema, all of these um, people. Usually you will find that there's somewhere um, that you can access for support. Uh, so, you know, yeah, have a conversation with, with your, 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 your clinician yeah. who can then, you know, sort of advise and have a think about and find out what exactly it is. is Ab possible. Absolutely. So to finish on, because I'm aware our time is up, um, is to speak to your local GP or practice nurse, find out um, where the specialist nurse is if, if you're not healing, or dermatology, bit slower route. But so the first port of call I would say is find your specialist nurse or podiatrist in your area um, for seeking help. Look at our website, look at the information, listen to this talk again on catch up next week, and they're all being videoed. And, um, uh, and please, Sarah, would you thank the gentleman that uh, spoke so eloquently about his experience as well? I think that was a, a powerful few minutes and um, I really thank you for that. And thank you for um, Ergo for being our platinum partners for Legs Matter. We couldn't do it without um, our, our sponsors and our supporters. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.